So in this first part of the experiment, your job is to torture a dolly. So for the first question, you put the doll on the back of the cart, and then we're going to yank the cart forward and describe what happens to the doll. Like that. In this first question, it's probably most useful to talk about how the doll moved relative to the table. In the second question, we don't want the dolly to fall off the cart in this case, but we are going to smash him into a brick wall as hard as we can. So you may want to pull a little gently at the beginning so he doesn't fall off, and then smash him into the wall. In this case, it's probably more useful to talk about how the doll moved relative to the cart rather than the table. The third case is exactly like the second, except this time we're going to give Dolly a bit of a seat belt. So you put the elastic band on, so that he's now got a seat belt, and then again we're going to smash him into the brick wall. And again, we describe how the doll moved relative to the cart. Question four is where you're going to explain the physics of these three cases. They specifically tell you to think about inertia, which is the idea of resistance to change, but it's also incredibly useful when you're trying to describe these three cases to think about Newton's first law, which is that a body at rest tends to stay at rest, and a body in motion tends to stay in motion unless it's acted on by a force. That one law describes these three cases. You just need to think about how. In this part of the experiment, we have a cart with some added masses on it, and we're going to apply forces to the cart and then measure the acceleration of it. So we'll be using the acceleration program for this. I'll give you a short refresher on how to use it on screen in a moment. As always, the first thing you're going to do is level your track carefully. So put the spirit level on there, look straight down, make sure that the bubble is centered. If it's not, make adjustments using the screw at the end of the track. The way in which we're going to apply forces to the cart is with this mass hanger. So it's on a string, and you attach it to the end of the cart, and then it gets dangled over a pulley here at the end of the track. And then that exerts a horizontal force on the cart, and it accelerates. You're going to capture that motion on screen, and as usual, you're going to fit a straight line through your velocity time graph in order to get the acceleration of your cart. We're going to study four different cases with the cart on the track, and we're going to compare the second case to the first case, and the third case to the first case, and the fourth case to the first case. So that first case is our control. We're going to compare the other three to it. That means that the graphs you're going to make for this first motion will need to be pasted into three different locations in your report. I'll show you where later. So you will need to print out three copies of your first graph for each person in your group, because you'll all need to paste that graph into three different locations in your book. And again, the first motion you're going to study is just the cart with all its added masses, and you would start your program, which I will show you later, and release it from rest, and let it accelerate to the end of the track. So that's your first trial. For the second trial, what you'll do is you'll take your cart, take all of the masses off of it, flip it upside down, and put the masses back on. And you're going to make a graph of this also. So it's not going to be a very interesting graph, obviously, but you'll make one and find out what the acceleration is. And the point of doing this trial is that we're still applying this force with the mass hanger, but the cart's not going anywhere anymore. And why is that? Well, because there's other forces involved now. Now there's two more trials that you'll do, but before you get to them, you first need to do question six in your lab manual. So I'm going to give you that quick refresher on how to use the acceleration program first, and then I'll give you some tips about how to do question six. Then I'll come back and show you the next two trials. So as usual, open the 1100 folder, and we want the acceleration program. Now in your first trial, the card is right side up with all the masses stacked on it and a mass hanger attached to it via a string. So to do your experiment, you pull back your cart, and then you would click Start, and release the cart. Now you may see a little bit of bounce back at the end of the track on your graph. You can ignore that. I don't have any. And the cart was being uniformly accelerated, so my position time graph is a curved line, as expected, and my velocity time graph is a straight line, as expected. And I can get the acceleration of the cart by fitting a straight line to the velocity time graph. So I would highlight my data, and then click Fit, Linear Fit, and that gives me the slope, which gives me my acceleration. 
Now the manual tells you that you're supposed to print out both of these graphs, but I'll let you know that only the velocity time graph is worth marks, so only print out the velocity time graph. And I'll remind you again that you're going to need this graph in three different locations in your report. So print out three copies for each member of your group. And another thing I'll mention is that the manual tells you to report the acceleration of your cart for each of the four cases we're studying. That means you need to write the acceleration down. So you paste your graph in and you also write in your acceleration. That is worth marks and it's easy to forget to do, so I wanted to warn you. So now I'll show you the next trials graph also, but first let me mention a glitchy thing about the program. And that is that you want to get rid of this box with slope value in it before you run another trial, or you won't be able to delete it later. So before you take your next set of data, you want to click fit again, and then no curve fits. That gets rid of that box, and now you can take new data without the old fit box still being on there. If you forget to do this, it's not a big deal. Fastest way to fix it is just to close the program down and reopen it, and that resets everything. So for the second trial, you take your cart, flip it, stack the masses back on, and then click start, and make a graph of this also. Once that's done, you're going to fit your data as usual. So highlight some linear data, click fit, linear fit. And then this goes in your report also. You only need one copy of it, however. So once you've got your first two graphs, then you can move on to question six in the lab manual. So now I'm going to talk about question six, but I'm zoomed out for a reason, and that's because I want to talk a little bit about question five again. So scrolling up to question five, recall that this is the case where you had the cart right side up and it accelerated down the track due to the mass hanger. And I mentioned that you need three copies of this graph in your lab report. So where do those three copies go? Well, the first one goes right here for question 5a, and then you'll have two more copies that need to go in your book. So where do they go? Well, the second one goes here in question 7a, and the third one goes here in question 8a. So in all three of those cases, you've always got a second graph, and you're going to compare the two graphs to each other. But that first graph that you made goes in questions 5, 7, and 8. So now let's go back and talk about question 6. So in question 6, there's several little questions you need to answer in it. And the first one is, when a force acts on an object, what happens? And your answer should be some variation on, well, it accelerates. However, that's not the full answer, but I'll leave it up to you and your partners to discuss this and come up with a more complete wording. Another thing I'll point out is that in this paper copy of the lab manual, they didn't leave space for you to answer that question, but it is worth marks, so squeeze it in somewhere. The next thing they ask you to do is to expand on that answer that you just gave by talking about three other cases that you've already looked at. And those three other cases are question three, which was the doll with the seat belt, question 5a, which is when the cart was right side up and the mass hanger was accelerating it down the track, and question 5b, which was the cart on the track, but flipped upside down. So the mass hanger was pulling on it, but it wasn't moving. And again, in this question, we're talking about forces acting on objects and whether or not that causes acceleration. And you're going to discuss these three cases. So doll with the seat belt, cart accelerating down the track, and upside down cart not accelerating down the track. And talk about how the forces are either causing acceleration or not causing acceleration in those three cases, and how that explains the motion you saw. So now I'll show you how to do the third trial. It's basically just like the first trial with one change, and that is we're going to take 50 grams off of the cart and we're going to put it on the mass hanger instead. So the reason why is that basically we've kept the entire mass of the system, everything that's being accelerated, the same, but we've doubled the amount of force being applied to the cart. So the total mass stays the same, but we've got double the force now. So you would again dangle this off the pulley, and capture the motion of the cart accelerating down the track. And in the fourth case, you take the 50 grams back off of the mass hanger, and you're going to put it back on the cart, but you're going to take the rest of the masses off the cart. So these come off. And the reason why we're doing that is that now the force is going to be the same as in case one, but the total mass of the system is roughly half. So we kept the force the same, but we halved the mass. And again, you'll capture this motion and find out how it changes the acceleration of the cart. So now I'll give you some hints on how to do questions 9 and 10. 
which relates specifically to the results of these two trials. So next I'm going to briefly explain what you need to do in questions 9 and 10. So in question 9, it's all about those two cases you just studied on the track. So question 9a says, if we double the force on a system, but keep the mass the same, what happens to the acceleration? So you would go back to question 7 and write down your actual values for the accelerations here, so real numbers. And you want to look for an obvious proportionality. So did the acceleration get twice as big, half as big, four times as big? Look for obvious proportionalities and answer this question based on your actual numbers. In question 9b, they ask, if you half the mass but keep the force the same, what happens to the acceleration then? So again, you'd go back to question 8 and you'd write down your acceleration values here. And then you'd try to identify obvious proportionalities and say what happens to the acceleration when you half the mass but keep the force the same. And then question 10 is where you bring it all together, and you say, how does the acceleration depend on force and mass? So you're going to write down an equation here, and hint, hint, it should look suspiciously similar to something you've seen in class, but you bring it all together based on your data. So you write down that law, and then you need to explain how this law that you just wrote down helps you explain all the results you've gotten so far. Specifically, you want to talk about the three cases with the doll and the four cases with the track. So you go through each of those and you talk about how this law that you wrote down explains what you saw in all of those cases. And to get full marks, you do need to talk about all three cases of the doll and all four cases of the track. In this part of the experiment, you have two carts and they've both got force probes. So one of them's got a loop on it and the other's just got a post. And you're going to bounce them off each other like this and measure the forces they exert on each other with these wireless sensors. So here is a slightly fuzzy close-up of the two sensors. First thing you want to do is turn them on. The little red light will start flashing, and when you get them connected to the program, that red light will turn green. Another thing to take note of is these little ID numbers here. So these will help you identify your two sensors out of all the sensors that are in the room. You will need those to set up the program. I'll show you the program you're going to use to do that in a moment. So one thing we're going to do, however, is we're going to put a mass on one of the carts, and we're going to call that the truck. So the truck is heavier. So this is a car, and this is a truck, and the experiment is to collide them into each other in different ways. So sometimes you'll collide the car into the truck, or the truck into the car, or you'll collide them together, like that. And then you're going to watch the forces that they exert on each other on screen and draw some conclusions. This week again, you're going to use Vernier Graphical Analysis. So go find that on the desktop and open it up. And you want to click Sensor Data Collection. And then you need to wait a moment for it to find your two wireless sensors. Now it's possible that you're going to find everybody in the room's sensors. So make sure you double check the numbers on the top of your sensor against what's here and only connect the two sensors that are on your desk. So when you find those, you click Connect. Let the first one connect and then click Connect again to connect the second one. Then you can click Done, and there's a few things you want to check here. So first of all, check the label on the y-axis. It should be showing two force probes here. So I've got one in blue and one in yellow. If you don't see both of them, then just click on this button and you can turn on the force 2 probe as well. So you want both of these turned on. Then, down here in the corner, we need to zero both of these sensors. So you click this little button and click zero, and then click the second one, and again click zero. Now there's one more thing you want to do, and that is click either one of these and reverse one of them. So click the button that says reverse on one of the sensors. So now you're ready to take some data, and I'm actually going to put up this and make this screen a wee bit smaller so that you can see what I'm doing on the track at the same time. So to take data, you would click collect, and then you can bounce these off of each other, and you can do it gently or fairly hard but you can see several of those interactions on screen in real time. So you would follow through the lab manual and study all the situations it asks you to and capture the graphs that you need. And to print this out, because this program doesn't allow us to print directly to the printer, what's easiest is to go to your keyboard and click the print screen button and then open up Word and you can paste in the image there. Now you can print out your screen capture. And obviously, we're studying Newton's third law here. When a body exerts a force on another, it experiences an equal and opposite reaction force from that other body. 
so you're testing to see whether the forces are equal, even though the truck is much heavier than the car. Now on the last page, question 12, I'm going to give you some very minor hints on how to do this. So there's three questions, and in each of these cases there's a little diagram and an arrow showing what direction the force that's being exerted is pointing. So for example, a person kicks the ball, or the person pushes on the floor. In each of these cases, you'll name the reaction force, and you also want to draw in the vector for the reaction force. So you draw an arrow on the diagram showing what direction the reaction force points. When you're naming the reaction forces, I don't need you to tell me the official name for it. You can just describe it in words to me. So for example, the person pushes on the ball. What does the ball do back to the person? You could describe it in words. The person pushes on the floor. What does the floor do back to the person? Again, you can just describe it in words, or if you know what it's called, go ahead and give me the official name for that reaction force. I will warn you that the third case, down here at the bottom, is fairly tricky. So I'm going to give you just a very modest hint in the way I'm wording things. In this case, the Earth is pulling on the person gravitationally. What does the person do back to the Earth? So think about that carefully with your partners. That's the only hint I'll give you.